This week, I've got Star Trek Discovery's master of metamorphosis, Glenn Hetrick, on hand to talk about this season's alien prosthetics and special effects. Plus, it's time to get excited for season two of Star Trek Picard with an exclusive clip from next week's premiere. Faster than catching a ride in a spatial cell, all this and more is coming up now in the Ready Room. Hey nerds, I'm Will Wheaton, and this is The Ready Room, your official behind the scenes hub for all things Star Trek universe. Can you believe we are now 10 episodes into season four of Star Trek Discovery? Things are getting literally intergalactic, which reminds me, red alert! If you haven't watched season four, episode 10, The Galactic Barrier, there are spoilers aplenty ahead. And if you proceed, you may find yourself dangerously adrift in an uncharted galaxy. Stream it first, then join us back here in The Ready Room today. I am incredibly excited to welcome the artist behind the many prosthetics of Star Trek Discovery. Head of makeup effects, Glenn Hetrick is here to discuss how he brings the many aliens of the 32nd century to life. This week's episode also got us thinking about what else we've seen of the space beyond our known galaxy. So we'll be taking a look at a few times the barrier has been breached by aliens and Federation alike in the Star Trek universe. But before all of that, it's time to get excited for Star Trek Picard season two. We have been looking forward to this for two years, y'all. So it is no surprise some of us could use a little bit of a refresher. Let's get prepped with this perfect Picard primer, a cue-worthy tongue twister. Control room, engage. It was quite an emotional experience for me at times as Jean-Luc when we meet him in season two. Jean-Luc is back in the chateau, Chateau Picard. He's alone, but he is being cared <laughs> for by Laris. But is he happy? I don't think Jean-Luc is sentimental. But he is exposed to memories he cannot control. It's about how a certain turmoil within him gets stirred up and what the outcomes of that is. I am very happy to be Chancellor of the Academy. Thank you very much. At the start of season two, we find Rafi has gone back to Starfleet. She's now actually teaching. She's uh, got her eye on her favorite cadet. The first fully Romulan cadet at Starfleet Academy, Elnor. At the start of season two, we find Elnor in Starfleet Academy. Rafi, who's, you know, kind of like a mentor to him as well as like a mother figure. She's really taken him under her wing and, you know, she's kind of just been helping him navigate life within the Academy. I think he's grown quite a bit. He's still learning things. He's still kind of that like awkward kid, but I'd say he's more phasing out of that process. At the beginning of season two, Seven has rejoined the Rangers, the Fenris Rangers. She's the captain of La Serena, and she's uh, battling some pirates when we first encounter her. <laughs> Assisted by one of the holographic versions of Rios on La Serena. <laughs> she's deactivated the rest of them because they annoyed her. <laughs> At the end of season one, we did see a little um, glimpse of the beginnings of a relationship between Seven and Rafi. You know, it's a bit of a time cut. Seven's off with the Rangers, Rafi's, I think, feeling a little left out. Because Rafaela has had some crutches that she's leaned on in the past of her addictions, she's vulnerable. That might be challenging for someone as strong and as uh, self-assured as Seven. For a number of reasons, I think. Maybe too much, too close, too, too human. Because that's something that Seven grapples with. It's definitely not, um, you know, a uh, white picket fence and uh, uh, a fairy tale. We've been touring the galaxy for over a year since the Federation ended the ban on synthetics. At the top of season two, we find Gerardi and Soji sort of doing a diplomatic tour of the universe. You can't ask for trust through an interpreter. It needs to come from here. Trying to, um, you know, speak about how these AI creatures are um, awesome. 
as this kind of synthetic emissary. She's making connections with planets all over and just to kind of ensure everyone like synthetics are okay. We are, we are good people and we want to enter the universe and the Federation. We want to be a part of you guys and we are, we're good people. <laughs> I know, Rio's called, you're going. I'm staying here to continue being charmingly diplomatic. Rios, this season is uh, very much, much a case of uh, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. What else but on, a, on the Stargazer, one of the most iconic ships. So, what's the big hurry, Captain? Shell that, there's no time. Give me a sec. It goes in line with who Rios is. He doesn't want a light job. He doesn't want something that's going to be easy. Some kind of subspace anomaly Starfleet sorted us to investigate. I could use you on this one. If he's going to do it, he's going to go for something that's uh, that's kind of a challenge. I imagine that he took this job on to have a different kind of closure with Starfleet. Like he wanted to write a different history. Admiral on the bridge. Season two was not looking so much at Picard's past but at his present and what he sees as a possible future. It's just a nice feeling to be back. I can't wait for them to see season two. Before we turn our focus and attention to season two of Picard entirely, let's spend a little bit of time today with season four of Discovery. Joining me to do that is Glenn Hetrick, head of makeup effects for Star Trek Discovery. Glenn, thank you so much for being here. I have so many alien questions. Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Been looking forward to it for a long time. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. Um, first of all, on behalf of everyone here at the Ready Room, congratulations on your third Emmy nomination for uh, prosthetics. Oh man, it's it's so incredible. Um, you know, dream come true. So. We, we do what we do because we love it. And, and then when you get to work on something like Star Trek, which is a lifelong obsession, it becomes surreal. But then when you start to get acknowledged for that work, it's it's inexplicable, uh, the joy. It's just this, it's this center of our lives. It's amazing. Uh, in this episode that we just saw, um, we were introduced to this brand new species. It is Oros, who is Tarka's cellmate and eventually becomes Tarka's friend. You got to sort of go from the ground up. I would love for you to put us into that room if you can. We start uh, an amazing collaborative process, unlike any I've experienced on any show, between Alex Kurtzman, Michelle Paradise, and uh, Tunde in Canada. We get together. And we go over, you know, with Michelle's uh, perspective as a showrunner, what's going on in the script. In that particular episode, we did several meetings and we discussed the emotion behind the character. Is your design process largely practical? Do you work with clay and tools or are you predominantly in a digital space where things maybe move faster? It's easier to send files back and forth. How does that part of the creative process work for you? Uh, it's very, very, very different from it was, what it was years ago. They had to sort of just uh, wink and a nod and you did, uh, you know, napkin diner sketches and kind of went for it. And that's what you got. And that's what went to camera. Uh, today, it's not that. <laughs> so yeah, no, we, we have a, a, a very, um, thick digital front end that we get out as many ideas as possible with a whole team of incredible artists. I have an artist named Jared Brantz that works with us on the show who, he, 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 the speed that he can give you variations. Yeah. Simultaneously, as soon as our actor is cast, we get him or her in life cast so that at the time we're signed off on it, we're already down the road with the sculpt. Then our producers weigh in on the sculpture, different angles, and the paint job. We still managed to get it to set in Toronto. Uh, so there's usually about a week, hopefully, of a, of a process where they put it on as a test and can adjust colors. I remember when I worked on Next Generation, Mike Westmore had a small room that was constructed inside a soundstage, and that's where he sculpted stuff and was just going to town. And I would just, every now and then I'd walk up to the door and just watch. It was so cool to watch him turn that into this stuff. I am appreciating so much more in ways I never did how remarkable what Michael and Jerry and everybody on, on our makeup crew did back in those days. Um, and it is so cool to see someone like you whose work blows my mind on a weekly basis talk about kind of standing on his shoulders. Yeah, it is that. It is absolutely standing on his shoulders. And I think we did we did some huge interview where I kind of wrote a piece about that, where if, if it wasn't for him and those characters, we would not be able to do what we do. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to stay as genuine 
to the design as we can because I love them all as much as, as, as all the fans do. So let's walk down that hallway a little bit together. Let's start out with President Rillick. I was the Federation's top ambassador for 20 years. Given the complexities that we'll face, I believe my skills will be needed. We're talking about bringing characters and designs that are canonical that exist and reinterpreting them in your own way. So President Rillick is not necessarily a new species, but she is Bajoran and Cardassian and sure. human. And you had to bring together all of those elements in a way that was sort of like biologically logical, that was visually pleasing, that like, that seems like a little bit of a heavy lift for me. Yeah, it's, it's very astute of you to have picked, on, that picked up on that makeup as something to discuss because it, it, it's elusively difficult. So the smaller it is, you go, oh, how hard could it be? It's actually much more difficult than some of the other things that we've done because of edge placement and making sure the blend is perfect perfect with the beauty makeup. So Rocky yeah. Faulkner and Nicola Bendry and our main team up in, in Canada um, with Adrian and Chris, th they really had to test the heck out of that thing. Uh, initial pitches, um, I, I was very much going down a road where there was a bit more to, to the president, where we sort of had this um, raised ridge on the tip of the chin, more of a Cardassian nod. Um, I had pitched like the ear lobe attachment to the sides of the jaw. And oh, cool. at one point, e even the really big trapezius, which is so Cardassian. Super Cardassian. As we reduce that to, to make, to, to balance the human with the alien, the end result is stunning, but the makeup becomes more difficult. The more we take away, the harder it is to hide the edges. So it, it was a huge process. I imagine with a character like the president, who's going to be in at least one day, almost every episode, usually more than that, you have to take into consideration, well, we've got to do Saru and we've got to do Linus and we've, you know, we've got to do all these other things. And like now we have to do the president as well. We only have so many artists. When we have so much time to put everything together, but then you also have to design them so that a human can act in this makeup all day long. Right. That seems incredibly challenging, particularly now with uh, with HD. So yeah, that's right. You, and you have to be far enough out to make sure that the crew can get augmented for those days if we have lots of Vulcans and Romulans. So you have to be able to make sure there's enough people scheduled on the right days to even be able to handle something like Relic. And then the touch up on the president is very difficult. You have to be right on it all day. If one shot ends up with a really rough edge, you can ruin the whole the whole shot. So she's a very difficult makeup. I couldn't be prouder of the team. Um, my lead sculptor, Michael Bryan, and my lead painter, Jamie Grove, and our, our mold maker extraordinaire, and um, our fabricator, Brian Van Doren and Ken Culver, they really came up with a way to build that thing. Uh -huh. So we, we had to truncate that process and get it as fast as possible, but also make sure that once it got into Rocky's hands in Toronto, that it was seamless, even in close up. Very, very tricky stuff. Um, I want to stay with uh, building off of existing designs and reinterpretations. And I really want to talk about um, uh, a couple of episodes ago. Welcome delegates, Federation, non-Federation, in person and remote. What is to this point in this season of Discovery, one of my absolute favorite cinematic moments in a, in a in, in that giant gathering of everyone in the in, in the Federation. So cool. I and and there are just so many species in there, but there is very clearly and deliberately framed and shown to us nerds a 900 years in the future Ferengi but has obviously evolved in interesting yeah. ways. Tell us all about that. The stuff like the Ferengis there for that, like I want to spark that level of interest every season because Alex is so cool and Michelle and Tinde are so cool to me. I uh, can come to the show and it, while, while we're dark in between seasons, this net conversation never stops here at home with my wife, Michelle, who works on the show day and night with me. Yeah. The list is always building. What do we want to do? Uh-huh. Harkening back already uh, to our previous conversation about uh, Michael Westmore. That's what I'm talking about. Let's play to flag, make him cool, make sure that we're honoring the integrity of the heart of the original character. For sure. The Ferengi is recognizable as a Ferengi. The heart of the Ferengi is there. All we really did 
was clean those lines up and, and make them tighter and sort of more se shape. I always kind of try to think like if you had more time to have done it when, when you're sculpting something, a lot of those makeups, which makes them more impressive to me, that's the impetus for all those decisions with the frame here or, or a canon character like that. Um, it's it's just so much fun to explore those things. Um, you get to augment uh, your incredible practical prosthetic effects uh, with digital video effects. And this is something that did not exist during the during my time on Star Trek. I think this is very much a new piece of technology. And and um, you had mentioned some things earlier that uh, I, I wanted to revisit when we talk about this. You had talked about the HD component of things and how the edges don't blend. And you get to have this incredible practical working collaborative relationship with Jason Zimmerman um, uh, f doing digital effects. Um, is that super cool or is, or do you just feel like I wish we could just do this practically or is it, or is it cool that you get to add something and take it to another level? If I'm being honest, Jason and his team are the absolute best I've ever worked with. And it's not just because we're working together on the show. And I, I learned on Marvel shows, Heroes, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that that blend of working together allows us to do things we couldn't do on our own. And you, when you embrace that and you work collaboratively, the result is spectacular. Linus, for instance, you want to find the most efficacious path forward to get the character on screen. If the cost is preclusive, even if we built him to work that way, you wouldn't see him as much. I'd rather you see him more and use this very rational, logical process of using a digi eye blink because that makes Linus very easy to use in episodes, right? You don't have to have mechanical cables and puppeteers. And so there are some things you do. There are some that you don't. Linus is one that you don't. And that's how we designed them to begin with. Again, it's it's a win for everybody. We get way more aliens than we would if we had to spend the money to do all these mechanical elements that it's not so much building them. It's how long they, you know this, it's how long they take to shoot, right? How yeah. much time you have to spend just shooting things until they work perfectly. You've done so many incredible designs uh, for Star Trek Discovery. Um, I don't want to ask you which one is your favorite. I want to ask you if there has been one that presented a challenge you didn't anticipate that, that either led to something cooler than you were expecting or was just real satisfying to overcome uh, to, to like end up with whatever on the screen. Um, it's Saru. Because I've worked with Doug and I've known him and loved him for so many years, when that character started to take shape, there was uh, several different designs. There's sort of a, a Y-headed design. And by the time we landed on what Saru is now, sort of amphibious thing, that right up to the finish line, there was a push for a green striped color. I mean, you could not get closer to we're not going to make it when finally the flesh version that you know, that fleshy tone with the cool patterns finally got approved and we went with it. And the reasoning was I didn't want an alien that I know is going to be on the bridge all the time uh, with such strong colors because it starts to reduce the palette for all the other aliens. Oh, how interesting. I know how good of an, uh, a performer Doug is. I know how good he is at his job. I know what an excellent performer he is. And yes. this unlocked that, this makeup unlocked that and allowed Doug to come through Saru. So what we did with Saru in the end and the way it serves the character, uh, I, I'm very, very proud of. I imagine that there are just so many people in the audience who are enthusiastically nodding along, going like, oh my God, you're doing exactly the thing that I do for fun, but you get paid for it. It's so totally cool. And rock and roll to all those people that feel that way. Uh, this has been such a lovely conversation and I have enjoyed your work for such a long time. It's so cool uh, that you chose to spend some time with us today. Thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of the season and uh, I cannot wait to find out uh, what you bring into the Star Trek world uh, uh, as the as the story unfolds and the seasons unroll before us. Same here. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the fans. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time, man. Hope to talk to you again soon. Today's guest, Glenn Hetrick, donned prosthetics of his own to play what character in the season two finale episode, Such Sweet Sorrow, part two? Don't pull to go anywhere. Stay tuned for the answer. This week's episode of Discovery is kind of a big deal. 
It's not often in Star Trek we get to travel beyond our own galaxy. I mean, you saw how bumpy the journey through the Galactic Barrier was, and if you know who Lieutenant Commander Gary Mitchell is, well, even getting close to the barrier has some pretty heavy repercussions. Let's take a look at what we know about this treacherous edge of the unknown. Commander Detmer, how soon until we reach the Galactic Barrier? Coming at a warp now, Captain. When it comes to boldly going where no one has gone before, Star Trek has explored the very boundaries of the imagination. Separating the Milky Way from the rest of the universe lies the Galactic Barrier, a treacherous border between the known and the yet to be discovered. The negative energy will eat through shields and fry a frontal cortex, like that. Captain Burnham and her crew face untold dangers beyond the barrier in season four of Star Trek Discovery. Is it wrong that I think that's pretty damn cool? Frontiers are always cool, Mr. Reese. If only we could enjoy it. But this isn't the first time the Federation has traveled to the edge of the galaxy and beyond. Approaching Galaxy Edge, sir. Neutralize warp, Mr. Mitchell. Hold this position. Captain Kirk and the crew of the USS Enterprise attempts to cross the galactic barrier in the third episode of Star Trek, the original series. The Enterprise enters the barrier to gather intel around the doomed voyage of the SS Valiant 200 years previous. Emergency stations. The ship reverses course quickly when the unstable conditions wreak havoc on the ship, as well as on one Lieutenant Commander Gary Mitchell, a crew member with an elevated ESP sensitivity. Sometimes I feel there's nothing I couldn't do in time. I'll just keep getting stronger. You know that, don't you? You will surrender your ship to me. Later, the Kelvins, an alien species from beyond the barrier, hijack and upgrade the Enterprise to return to the Andromeda galaxy. The Enterprise emerges from the barrier into the dark void that separates the galaxies. You're going to need something to wash that down with. Have you ever tried any Saurian brandy? But luckily, the crew regains control of the ship and returns to the Milky Way. We're going home. Star Trek's few other trips beyond the barrier were universally involuntary. An engineer driven mad at the sight of the Medusan Kolos takes the Enterprise through the barrier and into the void. Scotty, where are we? I don't know. Beyond the boundaries of the galaxy. Captain, we're passing warp 10. An experimental engine modification on the Enterprise D and a little help from the Traveler sends the ship well beyond the galactic barrier. Message on this has already been transmitted to Starfleet, sir. Which traveling subspace they should receive in 51 years, 10 months, nine weeks, 16 days. Mr. Data. Sir? Though perilous to enter, the galactic barrier remains a true gateway to boundless new discoveries. It won't be easy, but with this crew, I know that we'll succeed. Today's guest, Glenn Hetrick, donned prosthetics of his own to play what character in the season two finale, Such Sweet Sorrow, part two? And the answer is Cavort. Laurel's second in command, Cavort was a key participant in the battle against control and maybe the namesake of the Klingon's Cavort class bird of prey ship design. Okay, real talk. I am beyond excited that Picard and the La Serena crew will be back in all of our lives next week with the premiere of season two. I'm gonna be real with you. I have seen a lot of this season so far and it makes that part of my heart where Next Generation lives so enormous, which is why I can't wait for you to see this exclusive clip from the first episode. Alert. Life support failure. Move it, move it, move it. Alert. Alert. Power grid failure on deck five. 
Thank you, everyone, for joining me today in the Ready Room. With Discovery keeping me on the edge of my seat and Picard right around the corner, I am more grateful than ever to have you all along to talk Star Trek. I love getting my nerd on with you folks. Next week, we'll kick off an all new season of Star Trek Picard by speaking with Mon Capitan himself, Sir Patrick Stewart, about the premiere episode and what season two has in store. Until then, I'm Will Wheaton. Live long and prosper.